Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. And this is going to be Be'ezrat Hashem's special lecture in honor of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a very special uh, uh, Chag. And uh, it's, I think it falls uh, out to be on, on the month of Kislev uh, because there's a, a, a deep connection between the month of Kislev, which is many Hasidic dates, and also to the idea behind uh, Hanukkah. Hanukkah is connected to the purity, to the Kedusha of Am Yisrael, to the, um, uh, in a certain way, uh, um, to the Shemen, which is the oil that is connected to the deeper part of the Torah, the inner part of the Torah, Torah Hasidut. And um, Rabbi Herzl will explain to us more about the miracles in the past and the miracles in the present. Rabbi Herzl, Rabbi Thank you so much. And uh, honestly, even the first name of Rav, Rav Levi, is totally related to the Hanukkah miracle. As we know, this is the festival which was originated by Levi men Kohanim. In fact, the Hasidish of Minag, and so the Edo Mishrach here in Eretz Israel, is that the laning we start on Hanukkah, although traditionally it wasn't only the time of the Hasmonean miracle, it was the time when they dedicated the menorah, the sanctuary in the desert, mm. and uh, Ashkenaz started reading the Torah from that in Parshish Maso, the seventh Perk of Bamidbar, but the Hasidim and Sephardim started a few psukim earlier, they started with the Perk Kohanim, which is a then a Perk Vav, and the reason being is because in this particular case, the miracle that occurred to Am Yisrael was actually related to the Kohanim who did the whole thing, and out of respect to them, we give them the opening comments, if you want, of this wonderful miracle. We have, I want to take it a bit deeper, and the specific crowd that's here so far are people that have a pretty good background in what are learning, and so I'd rather overestimate than underestimate. <laughs> Anyhow, um, we have two rabbinical festivals pre annum one that's either one or two days here in Eretz Yisrael being Purim, and one that's a relatively longer one, eight days of Hanukkah. Fundamentally, there are two major differences between the two compared to the biblical ones, which are Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. One, the Purim story has the whole Sefer in the Tanakh, and Megillah. It's got a whole Gemara, a whole tractate dealing with it. In other words, there's a lot of text related to the wonderful miracle of Purim. We have a biblical text, we have a whole tractate in the Bavli, in the Rosham, a whole unit. Hanukkah, first of all, is a post-biblical miracle. It occurred after the Tanakh was already edited. The, edited was ready, well, the Tanakh was edited by Anshik Nessus Agdola, the great assembly, in the early part of the Second Temple when the Persians were here, and the Greeks only came by a century later. So we don't have in the Tanakh direct, there's hints to it, but I mean the story didn't happen in the biblical era. Well, a couple of the hints we have, the letter or the word or light is the 25th word in the Torah. The 25th uh, journey the Jews did in the desert was a place called Hashmona. And most interesting, those two are very famous, or and Hashmona, one that maybe even the rabbi may be less familiar with, possibly, is that in Parshas Emor we have a list of all the festivals starting with Shabbos as an opening. Then we have Pesach, the Omer, Shavuos, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini Atzeres. And the Perik ends with the words that many people start their Kiddush and Yom Tov. Vaidaber Moshe Moadei Hashem of Bnei Israel. Moshe had taught the festivals of Hashem to Bnei Israel. That's the end of Perik of Gimel and Vayikra. The next Perik, Perik of Talud, starts with the words, Vaidaber Hashem of Moshe Limor. If you take the Jewish calendar based on the festival cycle, not the yearly cycle starting on Rosh Hashanah, the first of the annual festivals is Pesach, where the Jews actually originally got their exodus from Egypt. We go by Nisan, that's Pesach, Shavuos, or the Omer is, the Omer is in Iyar also, Shavuos is Sivan, Rosh Hashanah is Tishrei, the beginning of the month, Yom Kippur is the 10th of the month, Sukkot is in the middle of the month, and it goes all the way to Shemini Atzeres. And then afterwards we talk about lighting the menorah two months later. So Rabbi David Svi Hoffman, one of the great uh, German Torah scholars, mentioned here is a very direct uh, indication 
not only of the Hanukkah miracle, but the order of the Psukim in the Torah relate us and bring us from the earliest festival cycle till when Hanukkah were to appear. Obviously, Purim is not necessary to mention, but in this case, because it's got a separate Megillah of its own. The fundamental difference that Hanukkah is not as a post-Tanakh miracle and, the Megillah, and Esther and Purim is part is what led the Hasidim in the course of history to differentiate between Hanukkah and Purim, that Purim is a Chag of Torah Shabbat and Hanukkah is a festival of Torah Shabbat Peh, the difference between the written law and the oral law. This is quite self-evident because the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat brings that as a result of the mir uh, marvelous miracle of Purim, the Jews accepted the revelation of Sinai, this time not with any coercion, but out of total self-will and desire. And that's found towards the end of Megillah Sester in the ninth parak. Kimu v'kiblu alem yudim v'alzaram. They took it upon themselves for the generations to come to be totally committed to the revelation. Hanukkah is, a, the miracle occurred in the second half of Bais Sheni, and shortly after that miracle occurred, what we have is the oh, enlightenment you. of the Tanaim of the Mishnah. In other words, the Mishnah is the first written text of the Jewish oral law. The oral law is what are most of what we have today in the Jewish library. The Rambam writes in his introduction to his commentary to the Mishnah that Rabbi Yudah Nasi, the editor of the Mishnah who completed the editing in the year plus 200, that's almost 1,823 years ago, he did a tremendous revolution. The revolution was because it wasn't permitted to put in writing the oral law. And this mm -hmm. tradition was going on that way for more than two millennia already. But the second base of Mikdash was destroyed in the plus 70 secular date, meaning 130 years before Rabbi Yudha Anasi compiled the final text of the Mishnah. And he was apprehensive, correctly so, that the Jews, as a result, not only of the destruction of the, of the Second Temple, but also the massacre the Romans did after the Bar Kochva revolt in the year 135, that's 65 years before the Mishnah was completed, that the Jews will disperse all over the world. And who's going to remember what was learned by heart? Who's going to actually keep it in tradition? Even when I prepare shir for uh, Rav Levi or other people, I try, not always, to put it in writing, or at least in the computer partially, so that even later on, if I'll have a less accessible, it'll be available, who wants to go in and learn the Torah. So Rabbi Yudah Nasi was saying, this is obviously extremely necessary, as the Jews are about to go all over. 524 chapters of Mishnah, over 3,500 Mishnayot all over, that he talks about six different themes, basically maintained the basic formal of the oral law. As a result of his spiritual revolution, second to none in Jewish tradition, I would say, then for the next three centuries, the Talmud, which was between the year 201 and 499, the Babylonian one, <coughs> the Jerusalem Talmud to 429, these were also put down in writing, although originally three centuries of Torah Shabal Peh, wisdom, was learned by heart, and then Ravina and Ravashi edited three centuries of wisdom in Babylon and in Eretz Israel together to give us 2,700 double pages of the Talmud, the Babylonian one, and about 1,250 double pages of the Jerusalem Talmud. Tremendous amount of wisdom, 3,950 pages of Talmuds, in order that we will have that tremendous treasure of the oral law for the generations to come. But what does this have to do with the Hanukkah miracle? as opposed to the story of Purim, which is the other issue, besides one being in writing and one being oral, Haman tried to destroy the Jewish people, men, women, and children, as he addresses clearly in the third chapter of his book. The Greeks, as opposed to Haman, were not interested in exterminating the Jewish people. 
They were trying to divert the focus of the Jewish people to another, another part of life, to focus on the philosophy and wisdom of the Greeks and the sport of, as it were, in Sparta, and not to actually focus on spiritual growth in the context of Torah. This leads us directly to one of the subjects in this forthcoming week, portion that we read this week, Parshas Vayishlach, when Yaakov was about to have that encounter with his biological twin brother, Esav, who he hadn't seen for over 30 years. Before that official visit takes place, in the middle of the night he has a visit of some spiritual representative from the side of Esav, who actually makes him partially lame during the course of the struggle. And our rabbis in Masechet Chulin have a, disp- a, a debate. What did Yaakov think of this person who was trying to wrestle with him? One says he thought that he was trying to kill Yaakov. Another one, Yaakov thought that this person was a scholar and was trying to spiritually defeat Yaakov. Who is more threatening, the person who wants to kill Yaakov a person who wants to uh, defeat Yaakov in theology. Obviously, if you're going to talk about the short term, you're going to say that a person, God forbid, who would assassinate Yaakov would be a more, much more threatening situation. <clears throat> Yet our rabbis are not necessarily convinced that Yaakov was less, less apprehensive with the other option. When Yaakov and Esau, the actual brothers, meet later on, and the Torah does say, that he went, ran towards him, Esav, Vayichabkeu Vayishakeu, that he hugged and kissed him. Our rabbis bring an opinion that the word Vayishakeu should be spelled with a chaf and not with a kuf, meaning they was trying to bite him. It's not nice to say about a brother who really is running up to hug you, all of us saying that he's trying to bite you. I mean... He's Mike Tyson. <laughs> In modern times, you could have said that Yaakov was worried that Esau would give him corona, so he figured better <laughs> off not hugging him rather than putting him into trouble. But in actual fact, it could be that Yaakov was more apprehensive of the hug than of the biting. The biting would injure Yaakov physically, but would not cause him to intermarriage with the with Esau's descendants. Once that hug and acceptance between the two would be wholeheartedly accepted by Yaakov, Yaakov would have a lot to worry about the forthcoming future. Even if you think, think for a moment, since most of the people in this room now, not Rev Levy, but including myself, have some relation to North America in that sense. Tomorrow night is 81 years to Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. You think for a moment, what would have been the actual result in World War II if the Japanese would have not attacked the United States? I mean, even in 1940, a year and a month before the attack in Pearl Harbor, there was an election in America, and Roosevelt promised this was his third election, 32 and 36 already was voted in. In 1940, he said that we're not going to get involved if we're not in threat. And, uh, of course, he did give arms and money to Churchill and to the Soviets, but physically the American military only got involved, not only after the Japanese got involved, three days later Hitler uh, asked the was asked by the Japanese to declare war on the United States as well. And once officially the Japanese declared war on the United States, so Roosevelt had an excuse not only to fight back the Japanese, but to send a major unit into Europe. Now, it's not that, unfortunately, not that many Jews were saved anyhow, but at least there was a final unconditional surrender of the entire German, Italian, and Japanese forces eventually in 1945. But much more important than that, there were already more than 5 million Jews in America in the time of World War II. There aren't many more counted Jews there today, and we're talking about 75 to 80 years later. And that's without a physical holocaust that occurred in the United States. So how was that? And there's 11 times more Baruch Hashem Jews in Eretz Israel today than there were 75 years ago. There were 600,000 
1948, and there's close to 7 million today, a little bit more of it. That, there's two major factors. One, of course, 50% or plus intermarriage in the United States. Number two, a high percentage of young men or women that don't get married at all. And if they do get married, don't necessarily have children. In California, every three married couples, there are two children all together. Why don't you try to compare that to Beitar Elite or Kiryat Sefer or Kedumim, and you'll see what the average is per family, Baruch Hashem, in these places, and you'll understand the difference. Fundamentally, that's what Yaakov was more concerned about. Yaakov was worried less about being injured physically rather than have to give a hug to a culture that he wanted to be away from. And Hanukkah, that essentially is the focus even though there was a definite military victory on Hanukkah, which is highlighted at least in the al Nisim prayer, both in the tefillah and in the benching. But when the Talmud explains the essence of the Hanukkah festival as he sees it, they're talking about the lighting of the candle of the menorah. And as you know, even if they couldn't have found pure oil for the purpose of lighting the menorah, they would have been allowed to light it without pure oil anyhow. It wasn't a critical miracle that occurred to the jug that was able to light eight days in order to actually technically perform the mitzvah in the temple. But that's precisely the issue. We are not looking just to technically get through the dry litter of the law. We are trying to expound ourselves to higher levels of spirituality and things that we are not required to do, but we want to go a step further in order to maintain Judaism for the generations to come. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, of course this is related technically to the secular year, but we are now at the shortest time of the year as far as the sunset is concerned. 4.39 p.m. in Jerusalem, is sunset now, that's the earliest that it occurs in the entire year. Hanukkah comes at a time when the amount of light in the northern hemisphere is the minimal. And we have a responsibility of our own to bring in that light. Our rabbis tell us that one of the fundamental differences between a biblical-based and rabbinical-based festival is that a biblical-based festival is called in the Kabbalah, Isaruta de la Eila, something that we are inspired to from, from the above with a capital A. Whereas the rabbinical ones is Itaruta de la Tata, it's something that our inspiration comes from ourselves. We are meant to do the next stage ourselves and to make it happen. By the Purim story, it's obvious because the original revelation at Sinai, as the Talmud brings, was partially coercive. And the motivation in the first place behind it was a commandment of Hashem to Moshe for the Jews to assemble by the mountain, totally orchestrated by the divine. Whereas Purim is something that essentially comes from below, all the mitzvahs pertaining to Purim, by the way, except for reading the Megillah, are totally man-to-man -man relationships. That's giving gifts to the poor, that's having a su'uda, and that's sending the portions from one to each other. Hanukkah also, we are expected, each one, to actually light the menorah, put in our dimension. And here in Eretz Yisrael, in this sense, I, we have an advantage of into Crown Heights. And that is, here in Eretz Yisrael, we light the menorah and the entrance to the house. Literally, in the entrance to, to our building or our residence. Where I live physically, we have a gate which leads into our apartment. And I light it, Mamish, next to the gate itself. Any person crossing by, either from the road or, carry, or climbing up the stairs where our apartments are, sees mine and the other people's Hanukkah or menorah, as you might call it, on your way upstairs. It's so obvious, it's so straightforward, and that's something that we are personally involved in doing. The Kabbalah we find that the two matriarchs that we met three days ago, Leah and Rachel, represent these two dimensions as well. I'll tell you something, the rabbi may know this one, but anyhow, it's a nice review for him. 
We know that the Torah says that Leah's eyes were soft and Rachel was very good looking. And our rabbis tell us, how can we possibly say something about a wonderful Jewish person that sounds a little bit negative towards them and let alone in something which is very external and not of something with, of spiritual growth? Lahavdil, even animals during the story of the flood, the deluge, the Torah says the animal that's not pure shall actually be not brought only two of them to the ark. When we talk about the pure animal, we say Be'imat Tahora, and we're talking about the one, we don't call it impure or tame. we say the animal that's not completely pure. We are so careful in our wording to choose words which are not detrimental in any way. How can we say something about a lovely woman that may be slightly less physical attractive than another one? That doesn't sound correct. So there are two major interpretations, one that Rashi brings, the other one which is found in the Talmud in Baba Basra. Rashi brings a famous tradition that uh, Yitzchak had two sons and Lovin had two major daughters, mm -hmm. and the arrangement was that the older son will marry the older daughter and the younger son will marry the younger daughter. And since Leah was slightly early, older than Rachel and Asa was older than Yaakov, so the equation was simple that Leah was designated to marry Asa, and she had already heard that Asa's behavior is not something that she would be proud of, and that caused her to be in tears, so her eyes become softer, weaker, and not as attractive as those as Rachel. So that actually is a praise of Leah, that what she was looking for is quality, and not anything physical about that so-called potential husband. But the interesting thing is, when Yitzchak gave instructions to his son Yaakov to leave their house, Yaakov heard two different messages. His mother said to him, you know, your brother is plotting to kill you, so please escape to my brother, your uncle, to his house in <coughs> Padanaram. Yitzchak says, yes, you're going to see your uncle in Padanaram Haran, but you're not going there because your brother will kill you. You're going there in order to marry one of his daughters. And for years I was thinking in my mind, Yaakov didn't marry one of his daughters, he married both daughters that were there, and according to some opinions, all four would have been sisters, but let's leave Zilpa and Bila at the moment aside. He definitely married two. So did Yaakov actually follow the instructions of his father or did not? In this last year, I got to a further understanding that Yaakov followed the exact instructions of his father. He actually chose to marry one of Lovan's daughters, and that one he met immediately was Rachel. Leah Yaakov didn't choose. Leah Hashem chose for him. And interestingly enough, if there was any mediator involved in bringing Leah to Yaakov, who was that? Leah's mother-in-law, Rivka. Why? Because what was Leah meant to get? She was meant to get the blessing that was designated for Asa by marrying him, and Rachel was meant to get with Yaakov the blessing that was designated for Yaakov. But as it were, Rivka intercepted by divine spirit the blessing designated for Asa, and that Yaakov received first when he wore the clothing that belonged to Asa. And essentially, the first of the two blessings that Yaakov had received was actually the one that designated for Asa. So in essence, what Rivka achieved was that Leah would be Yaakov's natural partner by divine decision. And not only that, she will be his first partner because the first bracha that Yaakov received was the bracha designated for Esav or for Leah, basically. Now, if you think what I'm saying is far-fetched, those who learned Afyomi may have learned six months ago, tractate called Yavamas, and there, when a person's brother passes away, childless, we have a Torah mitzvah, which is not, not exactly done that way today, because we're not sure that you're doing it for the sake of heaven, so they do chalitz instead, but in principle, you are to marry your late brother's wife. Yeah. And the Gemara calls it, 
Isha hiknu lo min hashamayim. The sister-in-law was acquired to you from heaven. Mm-hmm. Not even going on. We're only an all-male group here at the moment. I can say one additional thing about it. The Gemara actually says that you don't even have to write a reksuba. The reksuba that was written by the late brother stays in effect when the brother now marries her. The same one that he wrote at the time continues now through the next one. And in Kabbalistic terms, he's like actually uh, completing the soul of the late brother by marrying this woman who was the soulmate of his late brother. So we have this principle in Torah that sometimes a woman is given to you as a gift, not even something that you actually go ahead and fetch. And to that end, Rivka organized Leah for Yaakov. The Zohar says that Leah resembles the covered world and Rachel resembles the open side world. Everybody who saw Yaakov seeing Rachel for the first time was so impressive. They knew that they were going to be a couple. That was something that was obvious. But Leah, the relationship with Yaakov was far from obvious. So much to the extent that the first three children that Leah had, she named each one of them based on her relationship with her husband. It wasn't obvious to her at all until the fourth child, Yehuda, was born. The first three, she totally related her, her children to having a much better relationship with her husband. This even related to an Israeli joke related. When the third child was born, which our rabbi has that name, Leah said the reason why she called him Levi, Ata Pam Yilavei Shialai. Now, my husband is going to have to escort me because I have three children. There are, excuse me, there are some groups of religious people in Yushalayim that have a custom that the husband escorts his wife only when they have three kids or above. Earlier, they don't usually walk together. But, the official rationale is that while you have two children, it's no problem. She has two hands, she can take care of it. Once you have three, it becomes a little bit more complicated. If you want to take three kids out to a Shabbos walk or some other stroll that you're going with their carriages, you need an additional hand. So once we're three, she says that obviously Yaakov is going to join her. But when I saw once in Yerushalayim that that's not convincing. I was crossing the highway uh, by... Kiryat Moshe on the way towards the central bus station, and a woman was pushing there two what you call prams or what the Americans call carriages. One was a double carriage, the other one was a single. So she was pushing three children at once. And yours truly, about two and a half months ago, when three of my grandchildren were staying by us for Shabbos, I also took two carriages and took them myself to the park. That you can do if you have one that's a double and one's a single. It's not something that's not doable. But originally, that certainly was the case. But seriously, what the message there is very important. <clears throat> Leah, it was an unobvious relationship, but it was totally conveyed by Hashem. And the irony is that the success of Leah's children was very obvious. The Kehuna and the Levia are perpetual. The Davidian kingdom coming from Yehuda is the everlasting kingdom. And the Jewish court system comes from Yisachar, also one of Leah's kids. As opposed to that, Rachel, her older son Yosef, had the Mishkan in Shiloh until the Mishkan was destroyed. And Binyamin, her other son, who was born when she passed away, the first two Jewish kings were from Binyamin. But that's it. And the Ramban, Nachmanites, in the commentary, the end of Sefer Bereshis, said, delivery Hashem gave the first two kings to Binyamin, because his intention was to perpetuate the, the, the kingdom through Yehuda. So since Binyamin started and completed, Yehuda took over, and from then on, we say, We're talking about something that's for good. Those of you who have a bit of a background in Semitic languages, in this case, may Arabic as well, they explain the word, this is in Baba Basra, Ene le'a rakot shebirkotea arukot. The blessings that she gets are everlasting. 
in Arabic and in Aramaic, you have a prefix very often to the root, like the street not far away from here called Ibn Ezra. His name was Avram ben Ezra. In Arabic, a son is an Ibn, or not a Ben. They had a prefix, letter Aleph. So the word rakot can be from the word arukot, lengthy blessings. Not only was it not disrespectful, it was a very praiseworthy. So taking it further into the context of Hanukkah. The miracle in Bayes Rishon was obvious. The Davidian kingdom was there. The base of Migdash was there. The prophecy was there. In Bayes Sheni, there were five things that were lacking in the temple itself. The prophecy stopped 50 years after the Second Temple had begun, and Jewish independence. The only period in the whole period of Bayes Sheni where the Jews had political independence was in the time of the Asmoneans. And out of the relatively long period of Bayes Sheni, I could go into the debate now historically how long did it exist, but one thing is clear. How many years did the Jews have actual political independence in the whole Second Temple? between 77 and 81 years altogether. Judah, Shimon, and Jonathan, the Hasmonean kings, are the ones that had afterwards the Romans were involved. Beforehand, we had the Persians, the Greeks. That's what the Second Temple was like. The Romans were there for a huge amount of time. And how did the Romans get here? Because amongst the later Hasmonean leadership, there was a struggle between them so Yochanan Hurkanus invited the Romans to take over, and Pompey came to Jerusalem by the invitation of Judea. This week we read by Yishlach, the following week we're going to read by Yeshev, which is always read in the week uh, just before Hanukkah begins. And that unnecessary hatred expressed towards Yosef and his being sold is one of the main fundamental reasons why later on the Jews were enslaved in Egypt, and according to the Machzor and Yom Kippur, that's why the Second Temple was destroyed by the Romans. And the ten martyrs that are mentioned there resemble the ten brothers who were involved in Yosef's sale. Nine officially, but not going into the calculation of number ten at the moment, but that's how it works. And to that end, that's what eventually brought the destruction of the Second Temple in reality. The king himself invited the Romans to come. How can you do it worse than that? So we have to be extremely careful to understand that the Malchus, the royalty of the divine, in Bais Rishon, when there was a king in Abais Amigdash, and, and the facilities were all there, the divine presence was obvious. That's when things went in easy, and that was Dafka during the period of Leah. During the period of the second base of this period of Rachel, we don't have the divine blessing to the same extent as in the first temple. We don't have the Jewish kingdom. And yet, we have something else which is greater. We have the Torah Shabbat. We have the Oral Law. What used to be the base Migdash turned out to be the base Medrash. That's what we have instead. We have the house of study. And that tremendous act of Rabbi Yudah Nasi, which was a natural development from the Hasmonean miracle later on, that the oral law became so central, is what retained Jewish life for two and a half millennia in the diaspora, something that is still existent till this very day. And I think to that extent, Chabad have a tremendous contribution in that sense, that their <clears throat> intention to bring Shlichim all over the, the globe to ensure that the Jewish oral law message is sent to all parts of Jewish life is the most important mission that we have when the Beis HaMikdash is not around to ensure that the Torah is popular and known all over the world. As we said in a light conversation before the Shir began, if soccer is so popular all over the world, why can't Torah be at least as popular, at least within the Jewish world, as much as people are preoccupied and rubbish for three weeks already, so we can do something which is contributing to the world at large on a continuous basis. But that you need the combination of the obvious, that was through Leah, the Malchus, the Kahuna, and the Bastin, and also the less obvious through Rachel, in the second temple, where everything has to be done by us directly. 
And here's something beautiful related in this respect to Eretz Yisrael. Some of this you may be aware of, some of you may be less aware of. Yesterday I got a lucky question. Somebody has in his backyard some new green leaves, and he was asking me about these green leaves. Does he actually have to give the tithe, the Truman Maser, from those that are growing? I said to him, it depends what you use it for. If you use the leaf in order to make better tea, or you use it as part of the cooking process, then the answer is yes. If you don't use it for tea or for some food cooking, neither for a drink or for food, then it's not required. But other things, which are definitely consumed by the human, that obligation is compulsory by all standards. And what are the boundaries of Eretz Yisrael that are the highest level of obligation? Any place south of Acre and up to Ashkelon in the south. This was the boundaries of Eretz Yisrael most of the Second Temple period. In the First Temple, the Jews got all the way to southern Lebanon, and also in the south they got down to Eilat. And yet the obligations of Truma and Meiser and Eilat in the southern Negev, Negev and up north in Naria are less than in central Israel. Why? Because in the first base of Migdash, and before the base of Migdash was there, the first arrival of the Jews in Eretz Yisrael was done by military force when Yoshua took over the country. And it remained under that pretense of a military vect victory and independence. And when, unfortunately, the first temple was destroyed, most commentaries claim that that, including the Rambam, that that level of sanctity diminished. In the second temple, what defined Eretz Yisrael as holy for the sake of the mitzvahs is where the Jews actually settled in the country, whether under independence or not. The very fact that the Jew put his foot in that place and settled it in the Holy Land, that's what determined its sanctity. That's what made the major difference during the Second Temple. The actual place, namely, in the Second Base of Migdash, what counts is the human effort being done. In the First Temple, Yoshua's miracles were all done by Kodesh Baruch Hu in winning those wars, even though he had less than the other people around in certain the places, and he had a very successful mission. But this was given to him directly by Kodesh Baruch Hu. In the second base of Migdash, the expectancy is from our side. So it was true on the actual settling. It was true on developing the oral law, which is something that we are personally involved in doing. And it's also true when we light the Hanukkah candle ambram, when we are trying to inspire the world around to appreciate the miracles that we have. If you're thinking about miracles of the past and miracles of the present, take even that dimension itself. Between August 1939 and August 19, 1945, 6.1 million Jews were removed from the face of the earth, about 35% of world Jewry. And most of the places that were central in Torah study at that time were included in the areas, except in America and Israel, were included in the areas that were subject to destruction. There were places in London and in Antwerp, but the main Jewish centers of the time were actually amongst those that were destroyed. And yet, there is more people learning Torah today in the Jewish world than any other period in Jewish history. And uh, we're talking after such a huge destruction. It's rather amazing to figure out how many Jews are preoccupied on all different levels of Torah study nowadays, definitely more than in the time of the Talmud itself. So the Talmud has not, and the Torah has not been forgotten. That's number one. Number two, the chance after 35% of world Jewry and some of the very central parts of Jew world Jewry that were destroyed, that many people would be lost with their faith. And the fact that there's so many more that are turning back into faith in our days is a miracle of its own. And these are things which are evident 
and obvious. Needless to say that if you take what the Soviet Union was like in 1945 and what is remained of it nowadays, and even if you're going to say to me, and I'm not going to argue about it, that let's say 30 to 40 percent of those from there who come nowadays are not halakhically completely Jewish, but even as one of the leading scholars once said, even if you were to assume that out of all over a million people that came, a hundred thousand of them are definitely with a Jewish background, and if they would have stayed there, there would be nothing left of them whatsoever as far as Jewish identity. That in itself is a huge achievement, second to none, irrespective of your specific thinking about the fate of the others. Even if it were to be a hundred thousand families that are developing, you should know that there's 400,000 people from Russia who living in this country who are, were born here already. I wasn't born in this country. There are 400,000 of them who are living here today that already were born here. And you're talking in a, that an ex-community that the chances of survival were rather limited. So these are only some obvious ideas that are somewhat of a development of that Hanukkah principle. The Maral of Prague says the word Hanukkah comes from the word Chinuch, education, and dedication. In other words, it's an, a golden opportunity to bring back the inspiration of our connection to both parts, the written and oral law, in the context of a family. And you know what? In this country, I admit we don't feel it as much as in America for positive reasons. The winter here is very mild compared to where I was born in a small city called Chicago there. It wasn't such a mild winter. I remember 1971, that's a couple of years ago, and my sister was learning in the university in Chicago. I went to visit her with three, three sweaters and a coat on top and it was still cold. And that was uh, 15 below zero Fahrenheit. It wasn't overly positive. That's tomorrow, December 7th, and that year, I remember. You don't get those freezing situations here. But on the other hand, because as mentioned earlier in the Northern Hemisphere, <coughs> Hanukkah is very much in the darkest part of the year in the sense of that night comes very early. It's a golden opportunity to be with our families together and to be inspired from the light of the menorah which gives us a great opportunity to think about the historical recollection related to this story. Because if you take those five empires of ancient history, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, those were the fives that were in ancient history. What is left of them? Assyria is plain prehistorical study of history. Babylon, the excavations, if you look well enough, you'll see the city of Babylon under the ground, even today, it's flattened, but a lot of it, remnants are there. The city was flattened all the way to the floor. Like the Tanakh in Yermiel says, that's realistically what happened. The only one of those five that's still a little bit strong today, but not related at all to the real origin, is Persia. You give Iran any connection to Persia, go for it, although the Iranians today are not originating from there. They came from Arabia and from other places, but let it go. Greece, if not for the European Union, Greece would hardly exist today. A little bit, there's another neighbor of Greece called Israel, which helps them out pretty much. And the fifth one is Rome. Okay, I'll give you that imagination. One of the interesting things is the three major powers who fought against the civilized world in World War II, World War II, Germany, Italy, and Japan. In every one of those three countries, the birth rate is lower than the death rate per annum, and this has been going on for more than 60 years. You can check it up if I'm wrong. The only reason why Germany has grown is because in 1989, when the Iron Curtain fall fell down and the two West and East Germanys reunited, so practically Germany has more than 80 million people today. But the growth is not existent in those three countries. Take another country which, except the people in this room and a few others, wouldn't imagine how large it is. Take Indonesia. Southeastern China. How many people live in Indonesia today? What? 40 million? Give another number. I thought you were close. 234 million live in Indonesia. That's the largest Muslim country in the world. Non-Arab. There are 1.63 billion Muslims in the world today. 
and half of them are not Arabs themselves. These are Indonesia, that's in Iran, they're not Arabs. The ones in Turkey are not. The ones in the ex-Soviet republics are not. <coughs> and in America and in Germany, a lot of them are also not. In Arabia, yes, in Egypt, Syria, Jordan, uh, for example, where else not in Pakistan. They're not Arabs, they're uh, Muslims that developed and got there. In any event, what I'm saying is that those countries that did more than all to destroy human nature, 50 million people lost their lives in six years, six million of them us, but 50 million of the world as a whole were a totally unnecessary war that all the three who started the war lost the war. And realistically, their numbers are not growing. Japan has the most, has the most uh, uh, suicide rate amongst young people in any modern country in the world. This has been going on also for about 20 years. So they are also way below replacement rate. Oh, by far. You know, in Japan, there were over 100 million people in the war began, only 125 million today. And much less than 100 million in Indonesia when the war began, and it was more than double by now, triple. Egypt, country next door to here, we got 89 million people today, close to 90 million. Amazing numbers. So we have our requirements. We have to build the Torah Shabal Peh. We have to bring the light of Torah of all its sides to our lives. We need both Leah and Rachel. And the way to make it work is by national Jewish unity that doesn't have hatred amongst us. And Hanukkah is a golden opportunity to go in and do so. It's true that this is the most celebrated festival in the state of Israel, Hanukkah, till this day, and that includes many, many people who are, are just marginally traditional. Now, there are a number of reasons for it, but why not take the positive reason that the Israeli employment and educational calendar is based on the Jewish calendar and nothing else? The fact of the matter is, the employment cycle in this country is based on the Jewish calendar. You get off for Pesach, for Sukkot, the schools are off for Hanukkah, for Purim. You don't get off on December 25th, and not the week then either. You don't get off for Easter if it doesn't fall on Pesach. The Jewish calendar is dominated even in the regular life cycle. I can tell you 12 years ago, I was in New York City in early December, and it was Hanukkah vacation as I took my kids who at that time got their, got their U.S. citizenship from my mother. And uh, this is in Brooklyn and in Flatbush, if you went into any of the shopping centers, the Macy's around in Manhattan, you saw all the facilities related to the Gunnish December. And these are in the heart of serious religious neighborhoods. Came back to Eretz Israel, got to the airport, drove to Jerusalem, all the way, only menorahs with electricity of menorahs on the way home. It's a different feeling. You know what? I'm not saying that all the people that I passed on the way from the airport back to Jerusalem were people putting on Rabbeinu Tom's Tefillin in the morning. I didn't say that. But the natural inclination or the agenda that they operate with on a daily basis is something that I can associate with, something I can be proud with. Ultimately, the struggle between Yaakov and Esau, between Judea and Edom, or between Judea and Christianity and the Roman culture of the time is something that we have always been involved in the last two millennia. Even when I was in South Africa years ago, when Reb Levy was a younger person, if he was around already, uh, on the week before Pesach, there was a lady who came up to me and wanted to inspire me to be involved in her religion, what you call a missionary. So I said to her, okay, you want to try to explain to me? I'm willing to listen, but I have a condition. Once you quote something, the Old Testament in English incorrect, I ask you to kindly leave. Because the Old Testament, I think I follow pretty well. I didn't say that to her, but I let her go. By the seventh statement that she was saying, I'm sorry, lady, I'm going to bring a Jerusalem, I'm bring you a Bible now in. You quoted the book of Psalms totally different than what it says there. And I knew the Pusik that she was quoting. And by the time I came back just from the house of being, she already left. But I purposely wanted to hear what she was doing to figure out how they're operating. Mm -hmm. What did she really think? Now, 
Do you realize that they spend hundreds and millions of cash all over the world? What do they need my soul for today? What do I threaten them? What does it disturb her that I'm committed to Torah? After all, so to speak, the religion that she believes in began Jewish in the first place. They came from us. The end of this week's parish of Aishlach, the last two chiefs of Esav, one is called Magdiel and one is Iram, and Rashi writes there, Magdiel is Rome. And Rome in the Talmud is Edom, and in the medieval, like the Kuzari and the Rambam, as Christianity. Why? Because they started from Judaism and went, and went astray. And they're still, still trying to get back to me. That's what I started off earlier. Was he trying to hug Yaakov or was he trying to bite Yaakov? When I know it's an enemy who wants to fight against me, like where I live in Ramalta and 10 days ago we had a challenging situation, I know how to handle these situations and I at least know what I'm going facing. But when you're trying to change my religiosity and take advantage when I'm in a break and try to, so to speak, inspire me in the opposite direction and try to show that you're friends with me in order to motivate. Mm -hmm. That's where Hanukkah is chinuch. It's coming to educate us. No, we don't go for that. If anything, it's the other way around. If you have any questions, please, I kept it pretty long today, but since it was a nice group and intelligent, I figured I'd do something. Shakaf. My great pleasure, gentlemen.